Hello everyone and welcome back to Classic Comics. So a few months back I bought this 100 page Aquaman comic. One of these uh, DC 100 page giants. Uh, and I never got around to reviewing it. Then about two weeks ago I picked up this uh, 100 page giant Aquaman number two and I wanted to review it but since I never did the first one, I'd go ahead and just go ahead and do it first, even though that came out a little while back. So DC started doing these 100-page giant comics about, what, two years ago, I think? They started selling these in Walmart uh, in an obvious attempt to get their comics into the hands of younger readers who might not be able to get to a comic shop. Now, I thought it was a great idea, although I've never been able to find any of these 100-page comics at a Walmart. I've never seen them, and I've looked. I mean, where do they put them? I figured they would be where the magazines are, but I looked and there was nothing there. And then I looked in the section where they sell books, and nothing there, so I don't know. Now, since we're on the subject, uh, Aquaman has always been one of my favorite characters. Ever since I saw him in Super Friends in the early 70s. And I was thrilled to see him finally get a movie and be treated seriously. And the movie made a billion dollars. I loved that. I liked the movie a lot. Now, the main problem with it was that they tried to put too much in it in terms of characters. Black Manta probably didn't really need to be in that movie. I loved seeing him, but they tried sticking him into a movie that really didn't have room for him. I'm guessing they did that because they thought they wouldn't get a sequel which I understand, but unfortunately, or fortunately, we are getting a sequel. So hopefully uh, the next one will be more focused and more tight plot-wise. Anyway, so collectors, they swept in and they bought up all the early issues of these things at Walmarts, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of the exercise when it was meant to be reaching out to newer, younger readers and get them interested in comics. And then they took them and threw them up on eBay for like, you know, 500 or for 50 bucks or whatever. And there was also some controversy as comic shop owners were upset that DC was bypassing them and making these available only at Walmart. Now, they later backed off of that and you can get these at comic shops, too. That's where I bought this. I bought this at my uh, LCS. Now, these 100-page giants, they usually have a couple of original stories. Uh, followed by some reprints. Uh, they tell you on the covers what you'll find inside, uh, with all these little blurbs here, which I personally, uh, I really like this approach uh, to telling you what's inside the comic. Being an older guy who's been into comics pretty much his entire life, it reminds me of the exercise comics that DC used to publish back in the day, in the mid to late 70s mainly. Uh, comics book... Uh, comic books like Detective, Batman Family, Superman Family, and Adventure Comics would feature a number of stories by a variety of creators, and this sort of harkens back to those. Also, these comics are actually a pretty good buy. Uh, they cost, as you can see here, uh, five bucks, basically. Now, these days, your average comic costs four dollars and gives you maybe 20 to 24 pages of story. Now, these will give you four times that amount of content, but for only one more dollar. Not bad, really, when you consider how much comics cost these days. Basically, that's $1.25 for every 25 pages of story. And so, for that price, uh, these 100-page giants are worth checking out. And I'll probably do some more of these in the future, I think. So now, as you see, oh, and by the way, on this cover, you know, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, the cover on this, it's more sturdy than the, pay, the cover of a regular comic. This stuff is, if you can hear it there, it's almost like cardstock. You know, it's, it's really, really stiff. So this is quality stuff, which is nice to see. It's nice to see them putting some actual money into their product, unlike... A certain other publisher that I could name, uh, but I won't. So, uh, this issue has five separate stories. And since there's 
uh, so much story here. I'm going to cover these pretty quickly so this video doesn't get too long. Now, the first story we get uh, features uh, Black Manta. And he's breaking into a museum and going after this ancient Greek weapon called the, uh, the, the Sporting Snare. It's not a good name. <laughs> I'll admit this. It's not a good name for a, a weapon, the sporting snare. It's the basically it's this harpoon that is magic, and when you cast it at a at a, a target, it never misses. Supposedly, it's magic. But Aquaman is in New York visiting the UN, and he gets wind of what's going on, so he arrives, and we get this great two-page spread here, where Aquaman shows up, and this is how you introduce your hero right here. I mean, a great entrance. I also like Aquaman's outfit in this story. It's definitely, I think they modeled it kind of after Jason Momoa's costume in the Justice League movie. And just off topic a little, I liked Justice League. I knew it had problems, but I still enjoyed it, and I think it deserved better than it got. Anyway, so they have a battle, and the art is a bit mixed. I mean, overall it's pretty good, but... The artist, uh, he needs to work on his transitions a little bit, panel to panel. I mean, these two pages are pretty solid, but then here... So right here, he's standing, and Arthur is on his back. But then in the very next panel, he's now on the ground underneath Arthur, and Arthur is over him. He's flipping Arthur... Uh, excuse me. Flipping Arthur over into this display case. So it makes for kind of an, an awkward flow of the action. And then on this page, kind of a similar thing here, we get Aquaman. He's on the ground, lying on his belly, facing away from Manta. But then in the very next panel, <laughs> he somehow between panels managed to jump up, turn around, grab Manta, and heave him up by his legs. And then does this kind of WWE, you know, pro wrestling move on him. I'm not sure what move this is. Maybe it's like the cold, Stone Cold Stunner. I don't know. You know what? Actually, since this is Aquaman, uh, we'll call it the Splashdown. How about that? Yeah, so Aquaman does a Splashdown. <laughs> Aquaman does a Splashdown on him. And then uh, Manta attacks him with the snare. But it turns out, uh-oh, surprise, the snare is actually cursed, so it will turn on its wearer. And then... Aquaman just lays him out. Kaboom. So the story is short. It's only 16 pages, but it's pretty solid. The story is by, uh, as you see here, by Steve Orlando. And then uh, the art is by uh, Daniel Sampier. I, I think that's how you say it, with inks by Juan Albaran. And, you know, and overall, it's pretty good. Uh, the action, like I say, is pretty good, except for a couple of awkward kind of transitions there. Uh, Sam Peer is better, I think, with the kind of big splash pages, you know, and pin-up moments, that sort of thing, uh, than he is with, you know, storytelling, with having the story flow well from one panel to the next. That's a common flaw in young artists who are still refining their craft. So I'm guessing this is one of his early efforts. And uh, hopefully he'll get better in the future. The guy's definitely got some talent. So I hope we'll see more of him going forward. Now next is a story. This one's just eight pages long. Uh, Aquaman is pursued by some bad guys who want to use his DNA to create aquatic super soldiers. Uh, they chase him down. Uh, he gets caught. They take him back to his lair, or uh, back to their lair. But it turns out that Aquaman really just kind of let himself be caught because these guys had kidnapped some scientists to do the genetic work for them, and Aquaman wanted to find them, so he just lets himself get caught so they'll take him back to their hideout. And once they're there, he turns the tables on them and, uh, you know, summons some help. Again, it's eight pages, so not much to it, really. 
it's okay, but it's over so fast, it's really, you don't really have much of a feeling on it one way or the other. Now, it's written by Marv Wolfman. And how freaking ridiculous is that? DC has got Bendis writing how many freaking books? And they've got Tom King writing Batman. And yet they give Marv Wolfman this little backup story. Back in the 80s, Wolfman created the... He created the 80s version of the Teen Titans. You know, the version everyone likes. <laughs> and he wrote Crisis on Infinite Earths. He was arguably the most important writer at DC in the 1980s. And they're giving him this while Tom King was writing this huge run on Batman. Unbelievable. Ridiculous. Now, the art for this guy is a guy... Uh, the art for the story is a guy named Pop... Mon, I guess that's how you say it. I don't know. Uh, I never heard of him. Again, probably a, a newer artist trying to get a foothold in the business. He's okay. Uh, he actually reminds me of Jim Calafior or Jim Caliafor. I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. But he actually worked on Aquaman back in the mid-90s during Peter David's run. So that's cool. However, he does use copied panels a couple of times. Uh, yeah, here. These three panels. He basically just copies the same background and draw, or draws in some different... Well, actually, this isn't even different. These are identical. But he draws in some slightly different... Uh, these little, I don't know, sea sleds or whatever you want to call them. And then again, when they get him back to their hideout, again, you see these six panels. They're all the same panel. They just, he varies the figures a couple of times. But other than that, it's the same panel. So eh, it's a bit lazy. But I don't know. Maybe he was on a deadline. You never know. Now we get into the reprints. So this is a reprint of an issue from... Aquaman's New 52 series. Uh, it's one of the early ones when Jeff Johns was still writing the book. This issue is actually a prelude to the Throne of Atlantis storyline. Now, if you saw the Aquaman movie that came out, you know, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, they borrowed heavily from the Throne of Aquaman, or sorry, Throne of Atlantis storyline for that movie. They borrowed several uh, story elements from it. Now, this issue actually starts out in 1820. I don't know if you can see that there. 1820, the Atlantic. And you've got this whaling ship. And they use these harpoon guns to wound, you know, someone swimming in the water. Of course, it's an Atlantean. It's an Atlantean who looks really familiar. And they're going to kill him. But then some other Atlanteans arrive and... This sort of epilogue stops. Now, I looked up in Wikipedia, and according to Wikipedia, they didn't have these harpoon guns until the late 19th century, or late 1800s, in other words. So I'm guessing they probably didn't have them in 1820, so I'm pretty sure this is an anachronism right here. Now, then we go to Atlantis, and Ocean Master, who's kind of in the shadows here, he, he sees these fish confront him, and he realizes this is a message from Aquaman, who wants to meet with him. Then we go to uh, Belle Reve Prison, which, of course, is where the Suicide Squad is headquarters, or headquartered, and... Black Manta is in prison there, and Waller tries to get him to join the Suicide Squad, and he refuses, and he kills a guard. So, you know, that's fine. Then we cut back to Aquaman, and Ocean Master arrives, and they have this talk. And basically, Aquaman has reason to believe that someone in Atlantis is planning to attack the surface, and since Ocean Master is the king of Atlantis, 
he confronts Ocean Master and asks him if he's the one behind it. Ocean Master says, no, I'm not. I, you know, I don't know anything about this. Then at the end of the story, someone frees the uh, creatures that are trapped in the Marianas Trench. And if you saw the Aquaman movie, of course, you saw these trench creatures in the movie. They were one of the best things. This story is okay. With John's, you expect a little more. But, um, you know, it's not bad. Uh, not every story can be a home run. It does a good job of setting up Ocean Master as not that bad a guy, really. Unlike in the movie, in the comic book version of Throne of Atlantis, Ocean Master isn't the one who manipulates events into make, causing a war with the surface. It's not him, it's somebody else. He really has no plans for attacking the surface. He really doesn't care about the surface much. He doesn't trust them, but he has no interest in attacking or anything. Now, then we get a story from Mera's recent comic. Mera, Queen of Atlantis. And she's fighting a, a villain called the Eel. And this is a villain who was introduced by Will Pfeiffer during his uh, comic book run on Aquaman back in the late 90s. This is written by Dan Abnett with art by Lan Medina and Richard Friend. And during this story, when this is taking place, Aquaman has been usurped by another Atlantean and Aquaman is back in Atlantis leading a rebellion against the guy. Mira is not there because in a previous story she was injured by some sort of magic attack. And as a result, she can't breathe water. And her powers really aren't working properly. So she's stuck on the surface. She does manage to defeat him, though. And then she meets with... Superman and Wonder Woman to talk about incarcerating the guy. And I'm going to skip a bit here. And then she has a meeting with the Secretary of State where they discuss what's going on in Atlantis. And then the story ends with this, uh, we go to Ocean Master. Now, at this point, Ocean Master is actually up on the surface. He's actually uh, been living with a human woman. She's a single mother. Uh, for, I guess, several weeks now. And he's actually kind of fallen for her and wants to stay with them, but he knows about what's happening in Atlantis, and so he knows he, he has to leave. He has to go back to Atlantis, but he doesn't want to. So he's kind of torn by it. Now, the story overall is okay. Honestly, the figures are a bit stiff. Uh, the writing is really the better part of the story. I really like how Johns has reimagined Ocean Master. One of Johns' strength as a writer is his talent for taking villains who had been pretty simplistic, uh, you know, stereotypical villains, really, and then uh, turning them into more layered and complex characters. He did this with several characters in his uh, time on the Justice Society. But the first one that really got a lot of attention was when he did Sinestro, who had been a fairly one-note villain. You know, a stereotypical villain, really, right down to having that dick dastardly mustache that he's got. But Johns reinvented him, making him much more interesting as a villain. His intentions or his goals are actually not that bad, but he's a the-ends-justify-the-means person, which means he winds up committing a lot of villainous acts in the process. Now, I remember Stan Lee once said that the best villains are guys who could have been great heroes, but 
you know, some event happened, something happened that just turned them onto a bad path instead. Johns really takes that approach with his villains and does great work on them most of the time. Ocean Master is another good example of this. In his previous versions, before the New 52, Ocean Master was a, a fairly standard bad guy. Now, originally, he was just a high-tech pirate. But then they made him Aquaman's half-brother, and he was driven by jealousy. Then in the New 52, they kind of altered him again, where now he really has no grudge against Aquaman. But he's very proud to the point of arrogance, and he doesn't trust the surface world. So when Atlantis is attacked and appears the surface world is responsible, he doesn't hesitate to go to war with the surface. And again, we learn that he's kind of fallen in love with this woman that he's been staying with, and he doesn't want to uh, leave them and go back to Atlantis. Now, the last story is actually from the Teen Titans. From an issue of the Teen Titans. Now, it's in here because the story basically reintroduces... Uh, Jackson Hyde, who was the kind of the new 52 version of Aqualad. Uh, I guess he had kind of been dropped after the rebirth, kind of quasi reboot. So they are reintroducing him in this story. Now, the writing is by uh, Benjamin Percy, actually. And. If you follow uh, any of my uh, videos on X-Force, my reviews of X-Force, Percy's writing that book. And I think that's actually the best book in this current Marvel relaunch. It's actually a pretty solid book, and I recommend it. It's the only one I really recommend. The writing is solid, but the art by Koi Pham, I think is his name, it's kind of, eh, it's, it's not great. So Jackson feels like uh, he doesn't belong. You know, he feels very out of place. Partly it's because of his powers, but also partly because uh, he's gay, actually. And he decides to approach the Titans and try to join the team, figuring that he'll fit in better among other superhumans than he does, you know, with regular folks. Uh, so he travels to meet them, and then the Titans, they bring this reporter in and give her a tour of their headquarters. But then she disappears, and they go looking for her. And I'm going to skip a little bit here. And they actually wind up finding King Shark, who attacks them. And that's where it ends. So overall, it's a pretty solid effort. Out of five stories, we had three good ones and two that are just, you know, kind of so-so. But again, you're paying $1.25 for each story, basically. So overall, it's a good value. I recommend picking this up if you can still find it. Now, I'll be doing 100-page uh, Aquaman Giant number two, uh, probably in my next video. So I hope you'll be checking that video out. But first, uh, what about this issue? Uh, have any of you read this yourself? If you did, uh, what did you think? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Uh, do you agree that these 100-page comics are a good idea? Let me know in the comments. And also, while you're at it, please uh, like this video. And please uh, subscribe to the channel on your way out. And hit the bell for notifications of more videos. And I'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching.